how an unvented hot water cylinder works and also common faults. My name's Alan Hart and in today's video I'm back at Viva Training Academy and we've got Roy who is the trainer here and Roy's going to go through the unvented cylinder, he's going to talk to us about our safety controls, he's also going to show us or talk to us about common faults as well so when you go out to um, a cylinder if it's got problems with dripping um, drip, dripping into tundish etc he's going to go through all them with us as well in this video today if you do have any questions please put them in the comments below and as always we do have now we have a viva training academy um, playlist on this channel so if you want to click into that playlist you can go down the playlist and, and we're building up quite a good selection now of videos all to help um, new trainees and some people that's been doing it a long time as well always remember as in all our videos please refer to all the safety information tb118 uh, installation instructions g3 all, all this type of stuff um but yeah without further ado babbling on again without further ado let's go over to uh, roy thanks al Hi guys, it's Roy Fugler here at the Viva Training Academy over in Halifax again and today what we're going to be looking at is unvented cylinders. How they're installed, how they work, safety devices and all that lot. So we've got this one on rig, we're connected up to a Worcester system boiler, it's on an S-plan system so we've got two two-part valves on there and we've got all the safety devices and the functional control so we're going to be going through those. But before we start, for you guys out there to work on an unvented cylinder, to service it, to install it, to maintain it, you've got to be certificated. The reason for that is it's classed as a controlled service. What we mean by a controlled service is once that's been installed, it's got to be registered. A little bit like when you, you guys install a gas boiler, you register them with GasSafe. We've actually spoken to GasSafe this morning and they've confirmed, which were thought, for you guys that are gas safe registered, all you need to do is go on the gas safe website and you can register the cylinders with gas safe. I think they said it was something about £2.50 if you did it on the internet. If you do it over the phone, it's about four and a half quid. So for you guys that are gas safe registered, you can register the cylinders through gas safe, nice and simple. So the reason it's a control service is all about this document, G3 of the building regulations. This is the Bible. So this is uh, document G, which talks about things like uh, sanitation, hot water safety and water efficiency. And it's section G3 that applies. That's why some people turn around and say, I've got my G3 ticket. That means they've got the certification for it. As we're going through, we're going to refer to this because we're going to explain about certain safety devices and functionality. So I'm just going to pop that down to one side. So as you can see, coming in, we've got an isolation valve. It may have more than one isolation valve. Your main isolation valve is going to be a stop tap coming into your property. You may then have an isolation valve not too far away from your controls. And we're starting off with this one with what's called an inlet control group. What the inlet control group has is a number of devices. So the first thing in there is a pressure reducing valve. What that does, it reduces the pressure down from in some areas you can have it as high as five, six, seven, even 10 bar pressure. Now that'll drop it down somewhere between three and a half and two and a half bar, depending on what, what uh, control you're using. And we'll, we'll have a closer look at that shortly. You've also got inside there a strainer. The purpose of the strainer is to make sure we don't get any dirt going into there and stopping it doing its job and uh, any debris getting into other controls. We've also got an expansion release valve. Very similar to you guys that work on the boilers, you've got a PRV pressure uh, relief valve, this is an expansion relief. The reason they call it expansion relief, we've got the PRV there which is the pressure reducing valve, so not to confuse it with a PRV on a boiler which is a pressure relief valve. A little bit confusing for an old boy like me. Also in there you've got a non-return valve, the reason for the non-return valve is actually to stop any water any contamination going back in there it's a check valve once we get water past that lot there's a potential that it gets a little bit warm so therefore we could have some mild contamination due to temperature coming around onto the cylinder 
we've got the TMP, temperature and pressure release valve. That's there, that's our last line of defence for uh, any temperature related issues. And we're gonna cover those as we're going through. So that's in there and that operates on temperature and pressure. We've then got the, uh, the tongue dish and we've got D1 and D2 pipe work, discharge one, discharge two. We're gonna explain those as well as we go along. And then lower down, in, underneath the cover, what we've got in there are our controls for our uh, coil, because this is an indirect cylinder. It's got a coil in there, which is heated up through our boiler via our two part and our control. There's also an immersion heater in there. This one isn't wired up in the, in the center, but we've also got a thermostat and an overheat stat for that immersion heater. So they're the controls that we're gonna go through. So I'll start off with the first one, the inlet control group. So I've got one here. What I've done, I've, I've took this in bits so I can strip it out and show you how it works. So I've got to put my glasses on so I can see what I'm doing. So we already mentioned the expansion uh, relief. So this one's rated at six bar. So that's just clipped in. We could unclip it. And very similar to your pressure relief uh, valves on your boilers, they are tend to be sealed. You can't really strip them in bits and clean them out. So that's a replaceable part if that's found to be failing. The reason that this is in there is we have the expansion vessel. We've already talked about expansion of water on previous videos. It expands 4% its volume. So as you heat water up, once it starts getting past four or five degrees, which is at the point water starts to freeze, it goes cold, it starts to expand 4% uh, its volume up to about 99 degrees. And as soon as we go to steam, we expand 1,600 times its volume. So imagine one litre of water flashing to steam, 16,000 litres of steam. That's why it's a controlled service. Believe me, these things are bombs, or can be if they're not installed correctly. So the idea of this valve is if the expansion vessel loses its charge, or the charge is depleted, and the vessel can't take up the expansion, this thing starts to drip. Obviously then the water comes down this D1 and it comes into the tun dish. The tun dish is an air brake and that allows the customer to, to, to see any water. We're gonna come back to that as well. There's, there's a little thing I want to mention on that a little bit later on. So that's your expansion relief. So your pressure reducing valve. Now, they are usually manufacturer's set. They're not adjustable. This one's actually preset to three bar. The one on this rig is three and a half bar. So they can be anywhere from three and a half down to two bar. It is a serviceable item. So it's got a hex on there. I've preempted it by undo, by slapping it off. So underneath here, what we've got is the spring, which is keeping that pushed down. Inside there, then we've got the rest of the control. So if I just push that up, what I've got is the actual pressure reducing part of it. And then I've got my strainer in there. So that bit is straining out any debris. And then if we look down the end of there, we can actually see that we've got the non-return valve, the check valve. So that's an expansion relief, uh, pressure reducing valve and check valve all in one complete unit. Now some manufacturers will actually supply them separate. I've got some 15 mil ones here, so that's a strainer. So that will be straight in after my stop tap. And again, very, very simple. We've got a little cap on there and it's just got a gauze filter. For anybody that watched our videos about hydro blocks, they'll have seen a very similar filter in one of the isolation valves on the hydro block. So that's that. And again, we've got a single check valve. And the thing is, they've got arrows on there to indicate the direction of flow because we don't want it stopping the flow going the wrong way. So that is a single check valve. So the next thing we're gonna come on to is your temperature and pressure relief. So the idea behind that is that what it does, if the temperature goes above 90 degrees, it starts to drip. At 95, it goes full bar. So basically what we've got is three levels of temperature protection. So down here, we've got the customer control thermostat. That can be set up to about 70 degrees, but most customers have them somewhere between 
55, 60 degrees. That's the comfortable level. We've then got a manually reset overheat thermostat or energy cutout as it's referred to. They're typically 85 degrees. So if the thermostat fails, that should kick in. Now, obviously, if that energy cutout fails and it carries on heating up, we don't want that water because the regulation says we should not get any pipe above 100 degrees or up to 100 degrees. So that's why we have the temperature and pressure release set between 90 and 95 for temperature. Pressure wise, that's 10 bar. So we've got three and a half bar on our pressure reducing lot. Our expansion vessel will be set to three and a half bar. And we'll come back to the expansion vessel shortly um, because it, it's different to a central heating expansion vessel in the way it operates and the way it's designed and we'll come back to that. So that's set at the same pressure as the expansion vessel. So three and a half bar, that's typically somewhere between six and eight bar. On this one it's six bar and that one's 10 bar. So there's some of our safety devices. So the expansion vessel, when I say it's different, we did a video um, not long ago about an expansion vessel, how you check one on a boiler, I had it on a rig. Now on that one I explained you have a diaphragm down the middle so it separates it between one side is air and the other side is water. Now on these expansion vessels these are different, the reason for that is water quality. Obviously if we've got water which is touching metal we can get some corrosion. Now on a heating system we can combat that by putting inhibitors in, but you can't put inhibitors into your cold water supply. So typically inside there, it's like a bag. It's like a punch bag. So the water goes into the bag, so it's in a, a rubber membrane, and the air surrounds it. The air's around the outside, so that's actually stopping that water touching the metal. So that stops it from being contaminated. So that's the reason that these are slightly different. So always make sure if you're changing over your expansion vessels, you don't put a heating expansion vessel on water. Usually the colour coded. White ones tend to be for um, unvented cylinders. Red ones tend to be for central heating systems. But always double check. There is a diagram on the side of them which generally explains what type they are. So that's your expansion vessels. So we've covered most of the components on there. So I'm just going to have a look at the setup here. This is what's called an S-plan system. So we've got two zone valves, one for the heating, one for the hot water. On some larger modern properties, you might find two heating zones, possibly three if it's a really, really large property. It's all about energy efficiency. So we've got a hot water zone. So that's being controlled, as I said before, by the thermostat. So on a maintenance visit, what we're gonna do is check um, to make sure everything's working as it should be. So, We'd be checking the expansion vessel to make sure it's got its charge on. We'd be questioning the customer, have they seen any water dripping out of the tundish, things like that. We're also doing visual inspections. Part of the uh, qualification is determining D1 and D2 sizes. D1, and I'll move around here so I can point to it easier. D1 is your discharge from your expansion relief and your temperature and pressure relief up to your tongue dish and that should be no more than 600 mil long. D2 is your discharge from your tongue dish all the way to your drain area and that should be, there's a measurement on there and it's a minimum of 300 mil to your first bend. Now that's the first bend there and that's just over 300 mil. The reason for that is to stop it backing up. So if these things did the job um, they started to relieve the pressure. What we don't want to find out is that they back up and they cause uh, a flood. So part and parcel of a service, we'd come along and we'd test them. The easiest way to test them is just crack them open. So we're just going to crack the T&P, we open it up, and lo and behold, that one's shot straight back up. The reason being, I've opened it too quickly. What you've got to do is nice and gradually open it up and then increase the flow. And we can see that that's going away. We can also see that it's sealing. It's still just dripping a little bit, a bit of the water in there, but it's sealed, so that's fine. We'd also do the expansion relief, start it off nice and slowly, increasing the flow. 
and making sure that it's not backing up, it's running away correctly. So we've seen um, the uh, water flow through the tundish. So coming back to your D2, in part of G3 and in the manufacture of the cylinders uh, instructions, G3 size dependent on the length and the amount of bends. I'm going to put a chart up so you can see that. So basically, if we've got a 15 millimetre D1, D2 must be at least 22 millimetre. It must always be one size larger. Your D2 must also fall one in 200. The one in here falls a little bit steeper, just because at the other side of this wall, we've got some heating pipes and we had to miss those. So basically, you're looking at a, uh, a minimum of a nine metre long piece of pipe. That doesn't include the elbows. So if you're adding the elbows up, you may need to go from 15 to 28, depending on your size, but you need to refer to the instructions. And it's part of the qualification when you do the G3 qualification that you're shown how to do the calculations and you may have some of those calculations in the assessment. So that's one of the things on a service that we do. We'd be checking the expansion vessel, checking those are discharging. We'd also be checking things like the standing pressure. So we've got this cold tap turned on, and we've got a standing pressure, and again, I need to put my specs on to see. So my standing pressure there is about four bar. Now this is coming off a, uh, it's coming off after the control group. So we're talking about a balanced supply. When we talk about balanced supply, what we're talking about is the cold and the hot are at the same pressures. The reason for that is if you've got the hot water at a lower pressure than your cold water, so your cold water's coming off before you stop tap, what you can find then in, with, with things like mixers, um, showers, mixer taps, bidets, that type of thing, the cold water's overcoming the hot water and you might find uh, terminal fittings downstream, so taps further downstream, you might find that they're compromised, the cold water's mixing with the hot and you're getting cooler water, so that can be a complaint. I've even had that with combis, with the larger plate heat exchanges, where customers are complaining that the water in the kitchen sink's fine, the boiler's in the kitchen, but going into the bathroom in the basin sink, the hot water's not coming through as warm because it's being blended with some of the cold down in the, uh, in the kitchen. So coming back to that, we've got the, uh, the standing pressure. So if we turn this other tap, uh, cold tap on, we can see what the working pressure is. So the working pressure there has just dropped a little bit. This is three and a half bar, so it's not too far away from that. So the next thing that we do, and we do this on a service, on a commission, we're going to check the flow rate at our terminal fitting. So I move across now onto my hot tap, and I've got my weir gauge. I'm just going to pop that in there, turn that on. Turn it on at full rate, and I can see there I'm getting a good 18 to 20 litres a minute. So that's a really good flow rate on there. That's one of the reasons a lot of new build now are moving over to having unvented cylinders and system boilers because combis just can't deliver the volume of hot water, especially to two taps. So again, if you guys are going to be working on anything like that, because most new build, they only give two years warranty. So after the first two years, they need to get somebody in to have a look at it. And if you've got the, your gas qualification, you're quite happily working on the boiler, you've got the qualification, you need the qualification for your cylinder so you can cover the whole lot. The other thing with cylinders is, the, you fill a benchmark in and we'll show you a benchmark as part of doing the installation. So it's very much like when you're installing a boiler and that's for the warranty as well. So they need to be, uh, to be filled in. So we'll, we'll show you those and um, we'll overcut them onto the video. So the last little bit we're gonna talk about is, is common faults, things that you can find. So we'll start at the beginning. Obviously we've talked about there's a strainer in there. That's a certain size. One of the things that can happen, the water, the water authorities come and dig the road up and um, they disturb the water pipes there's debris gets in there and the next thing is we're turning taps on and we're getting we're getting dirt coming out of them and obviously on a combi boiler that's that's going to go into things like your plate heat exchanger if there's no filter in there now on an unvented system you could be getting the situation so if a customer's complaining the hot water's not flowing as fast as it usually does 
First thing to ask them, have you noticed any discoloration in the water, any dirty water? As you're driving up to the job, the old visual inspection, can you see any, any new tarmac, any potholes? Has the road been dug up? Simple things like that. So that's the first one. Pressure reducing valve, they could fail. So if the customer's complaining, the water's over spilling out the basins and things, it's not being reduced properly. That could be failing in, inside there. Um, so we're not getting that pressure reduction. Could be on the other side of the coin, that we're getting too little pressure if, if something else has gone wrong. But one of the other ones of overpressurization is obviously we've got a six bar expansion relief. Now if the expansion vessel's fine and it's got its charge in there, that's, that's okay. Um, but it could be a sign that if we're getting cold water discharging through the tun dish, it could be the pressure reducing valve isn't reducing the pressure, could be the expansion vessel. The other thing to think about is there are some uh, unvented cylinders that don't have expansion vessels. They have a bubble top. Heat race hard, you make some, ozo make some. And what they have, they have an air gap at the top of the cylinder. As the cylinder's been filled up, coming off the top, the tube which takes the water to the hot taps is, is, is probably about 300 mil long. So it goes down, so they're getting some air trapped up at the top of the cylinder and that acts very very similar to your expansion vessel so again if you go to a job and there's no expansion vessel don't think somebody's not fitted one check the manufacturer's instructions to make sure that it's one that needs an expansion vessel it could be one that has what's referred to as a bubble top so that's something else to look out for so cold water discharging from uh, the tongue dish or coming out the tongue dish that's generally pressure reducing valve fail or expansion vessel with no charge in it. And charging it up is very similar to what you do on a combi boiler, on a heating system. So turning the, the pressure off, opening a hot tap, waiting for it to lose pressure, check it with a Schrader uh, valve or, or a, a pump, and then pressurize it up to the same pressure that's on your expansion relief. So if that is in this, sorry, the R, uh, pressure reducing valve. So in this one's case, it's three and a half bar. So that's three and a half bar. If that was a two bar, you'd expand that up to two bar. So you have them in equal pressures. So you've got an equilibrium there. So if your TMP is discharging, that's going to be hot water. So it's going to be hot water coming out there. So that's something else to look for. Coming back to this one, if it's your pressure reducing valve, that's probably going to be leaking all the time. If it's down to lack of expansion, that's only going to be when the cylinder's heating up. So if it's an intermittent drip of cold water, more likely an expansion vessel. If it's permanent, more likely pressure reducing valve. So TMP. Now if your TMP is dripping, that could be a sign that the TMP's failed on the spring, on the pressure side of it. If it's doing it on the temperature side, remember that's the last stage of temperature safety so we're going to be looking at potentially we've got a problem with our customer control stat and we've also got a problem with our energy cutoff or overheat stat some people refer it to it does the same job it gets to a temperature it breaks a circuit and remember on those there are manual reset that's part of the regs it's got to be manually reset i've come across them in the past where they've been tripping the thermostat started playing up it's been tripping on the overheat stat and lo and behold, Mr. Miggins has come along, yeah, Mr. Miggins is back. Mrs. Miggins is sick of him fiddling about. He's took it off there and he's worked out if he pulls the two connections off, puts them together. Fortunately, he did turn the power off so he didn't get an electric shock. I wish he hadn't done, served him right. But if he'd have put those two across, he's brought, broached a safety device. Oh, in the right mind, broached a safety device, meddlers. So that could be a sign that that's why that's dripping. Somebody's broached a safety device. So there's some of the common faults that you can find. Again, one of the other ones, checking where the termination is outside. I've seen uh, D2s terminate quite close. There's a minimum gap. It should be at least 100 mil above ground level if it's terminating outside. Because if it's lower, what you can get is a buildup of debris, detritus underneath it, all sorts of other things and that can cause it to block off. So, there's some of the common things that you'll find with them. Um, we've gone through quite a lot of stuff. If there's anything else you'd like, please comment below. If there's any other videos you'd like, 
If there's anything you want us to cover, please let us know. If there's any more questions about Unvented, ask them in the comments box. Me or Alan will get back to you and reply. So, from Halifax and Roy Fugler at Viva, thanks so much for watching. Until next time.